Good morning, everyone. It's Reverend Mike Capron. Um, we are uh, doing a summer series called Narrating uh, Your Story, in which we look at various Bible stories that um, could be interpreted in different ways. The basic idea is that we, the various events that happen in our lives, both good and bad, uh, we have some choice about how we talk about them. We saw this two weeks ago with Joseph and his brothers who sold him into slavery. Uh, decades later, they understood the evil they'd done, but he had come to see it differently. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. Over the course of the series, we're going to look at some obscure stories in the Bible and some big important ones, and I doubt that any will be bigger than today's. Today we look at the death of Jesus. Um, so I'm going to start by reading uh, the account of Jesus' death from the Gospel of Mark. Here we go. Mark 15, 33 to 41. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those standing near heard this. They said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine, vinegar, and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion, the Roman soldier, who stood there in front of Jesus, saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come with him to Jerusalem, were also there. This ends our reading. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. Jesus agrees on a lot about the death of Jesus. He was crucified, he died, and rose again. All the accounts of the crucifixion agree that the closest witnesses to his actual death were a group of women who knew and loved him. Beyond that, when you look at the details, you'll see that we have four different accounts of Jesus' death. And I'm going to put in the comments section a, a document that shows all four accounts together on one page. But why do we have these four accounts? Scholars wonder and debate about who wrote the Gospels and when they were written, but it seems that the earliest of them may have been written, say, 20 years after Jesus' death, and the latest might be another 50 years past that one. So a lot of time has gone by. And here's one way to think about it. My mother's been dead for about 15 years now. I suspect that if my brothers and I set out to write biographies of my mother, we might emphasize different things, remember different episodes, and perhaps want to tell somewhat different kinds of stories. One of us might focus on the hardships of her life, another on the joys, another on her faith uh, and her life in the church. We would be writing about the same person, but from different perspectives and with different goals. In that same vein, as we talk about these accounts of Jesus' death, I'm going to assume that Mark told us what Mark wanted us to know, that Matthew told us what Matthew wanted us to know, and the same with Luke and with John. Everyone agrees that Mark wrote first, so that's the one we just read, and uh, it's the first one we'll talk about. Mark is the most visceral. <laughs> um, reading Mark can sometimes be like a gut punch. And so Jesus' last words quoted from his native Aramaic language are these, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. What does that mean? It means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what are we to make of that? One of the simplest, most straightforward interpretations is that in that particular moment of anguish, Jesus felt abandoned by God. It makes me cringe a bit to say that. It feels strange to say that about Jesus. It 
It feels like I'm looking directly at him in a moment when I ought to avert my eyes. It feels too personal, too intimate. One shouldn't speak ill of the dead. One shouldn't reflect overmuch on a moment of weakness, especially when it's so different from a lifetime of strength. And yet, there is something sort of comforting about it. Lord knows I have my moments of pain and doubt. It is somehow comforting to think that Jesus had one too. He was. God, immortal, invisible, God only wise, to quote one song, become one of us, a slob like one of us, to quote another song, a fragile and fearful mortal human being. To imagine Jesus in this way is to be comforted by the thought that he really does understand me. We aren't the same, of course, but in his worst moment, perhaps he understands my worst moment and has genuine compassion mixed in with his infinite mercy. That is one way to narrate Jesus' last words, but it's not the only way. Many people have noticed that, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is also the first line of Psalm 22. So maybe Jesus really hasn't lost control. Maybe he's just quoting scripture. He's being prayerful. Uh, this narrative can be an out for people who are uncomfortable with the previous one. Not that the two are mutually exclusive. Jesus could have genuinely been anguished and expressed his anguish with words of scripture. One more note about these last words. I've always been a little confused about why the crowd thinks he is calling for Elijah. Apparently the word Eli and that phrase and the Aramaic pronunciation of Elijah's name are really similar. So the people might simply have misheard Jesus and thought he was calling for Elijah to come help him. Um, there's another way to narrate events when we now consider incorrect that happened right there at the cross. All right, on to Matthew's account. As I said, Mark wrote first, and it's really clear that Matthew and Luke had a copy of Mark available when they were writing their Gospels. You can see that when you look at Mark and Matthew side by side, extremely similar. Here's a detail. Both of them agree that the curtain in the temple was torn in two. This is the heavy, ornate curtain that separated the innermost room of the temple, the Holy of Holies, where folks imagine God actually lived. And it was separated by this curtain from the outside world. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke all agree that it was destroyed, meaning that the spirit and power of God is now out there in the entire world, not confined to one small spot. Unique among the Gospels, Mark, excuse me, Matthew narrates this with an earthquake and holy people raised from the dead for a time, walking around the city greeting people. That does add a feeling of gravitas and awe to the story. Time is short, so on to Luke. This seems to be one of the many occasions when Luke thinks Mark is too wordy, so his version is the shortest of any of them. In Luke's gospel, Jesus' last words are different. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. There's no anguish here. Instead, there is acceptance and faith. Jesus has faithfully engaged in the ministry his Heavenly Father sent him to do. He has lived in faith and he dies in faith. He knows where his spirit is going, back to the Father. Some people die like that. No doubts or regrets for them. Just a confidence, perhaps even an impatience to go and be with their Lord. I would guess that those people resonate with Luke's account of Jesus. This might be their favorite gospel. and That's good. Some people in the history of the church suggested that it was rather awkward to have four Gospels. Maybe we should pick one, they said. Or perhaps we should just edit them all together and produce a single account. Maybe Jesus said all these last words in some order. We could just string them together. And the church clearly told those people, no. We were left four Gospels by our forebears in the first century, and we will keep all four of them. Well, and this leads us to the fourth gospel, John. If Mark, Matthew, and Luke all emphasize the humanity of Jesus, 
John emphasizes his divinity. I remember being in a study group where one of my seminary classmates explained, Jesus just waltzes through the Gospel of John. And he was kind of right about that. John's account has less anguish. It shows so much of Jesus' love and concern for his followers. Jesus uh, engages in an extended, multi-chapter, high priestly prayer after the Last Supper, but before his arrest where he prays for his followers and commends them to the Father. And even hanging on the cross, John's Jesus makes arrangements for John to take care of his mother. Verses 26 and 27. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Jesus' last words are also different in John. Verse 30, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Very simple, very concise. An echo of verse 28, knowing that everything had now been fulfilled and so that scripture would be fulfilled. It feels peaceful to me. It's a really odd thing to say about a horrific death on the cross, but the words, the demeanor, at least how I imagine them, it, it feels, well, peaceful, satisfied in a mission accomplished sort of way. Echoing chapter one, the word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. Then it was finished with its mission and returned, but the world will never be the same. Even though it is less flashy than Matthew's earthquake, the impact, the change, feels more profound in John. I've had some parents tell me that you never admit to having a favorite child, but that you probably do have one. And so, while we all love the Bible and all four Gospels, you probably have a favorite story out of these four we discussed. Probably one resonates with you more, at least today. That's okay. It's actually very good. We want with people to we want people to connect with the Bible in their daily life. We want them to view the events of their life with a lens of Scripture. And the parts of the Bible that you connect with may change as your life changes. But I hope that you will notice that the church has four different accounts of Jesus' death. Our spiritual ancestors wanted us to have all four as resources that we connect with as our need and the spirit give impulse. And so just as you have a choice about which gospel to connect with on a given day, you have some choice as to how you narrate the events of your life and the life of our church. Some days may feel painful and visceral. Some may feel dramatic, like the earth is moving under your feet. Others may come with a calm faith, a sense that you're traveling the path that God has set out for you. And still others may have a mysterious sense of peace that passes all rational understanding. Friends, my conclusion is simple. Go with whatever God gives you and pray with the story, the narrative that fits where you are. This is our life. And we will use the tools provided to us, continuing to step out in faith in all times and circumstances. Grace and peace to you, my friends. I'm so grateful for all of you.